Religion won't save you from your trauma, and therapy won't quench your thirst for God. Often we see spirituality and therapy flirting at the edges of their respective realms, but I would argue that now is an important time, if not the most important time, to try and find a synthesis, especially if we consider that 75 percent of people aged 18 to 29, at least in America, identify with the label of spiritual, but not religious. We're at a very interesting moment in history, because where do these people go? The old religious orders are no longer relevant for the majority of young people, or really anyone under the age of 40, but neither do we have a robust enough place to satisfy that genuine desire for sanctity, sacredness, and godliness in an otherwise flat, shallow, overstimulated, dissociative, digital, and potentially godless culture. It's a very interesting moment in history, and I would argue that integral spirituality might be the solution. We can't accurately blend religion or spirituality and therapy or healing together as if they were the same thing. But that flirting at the edges, that very natural magnetization between the two areas of human experience or expertise or whatever you want to call it, they always seem to come together. Not a single week goes by in my client sessions where there's not an explicit or implicit question of faith as it relates to healing trauma. And I'm talking childhood abuse. I'm talking relational abuse. I'm talking suicide or despair. I'm talking addiction. These questions can't be resolved with therapy alone, but religion is not the only medicine when it comes to a full spectrum approach to releasing the baggage that we carry. In this episode of Inner Work Essentials, we're going to be drawing upon the religion of tomorrow, which is a wonderful book, which I hope you can see, I hope it's the right way up, by Ken Wilber, the famous integral philosopher who I've curried, curried, I haven't curried him, I'm not going to eat him, but I have covered him in this series, and A Brief History of Everything is where I recommend you start with him. A fantastic philosopher, fantastic psychologist, and some would argue one of the most important thinkers of the late 20th century because he charted the spectrum of consciousness in a way which is so applicable and so practical, but also offers an incredible degree of abstraction and esotericism for the person who's interested. I've actually got the book turned right here to the beginning of the section on shadow work. I'm going to read you a little extract to kick things off. He says, as, as I have mentioned, quote, few, if any, spiritual systems have any extensive or sophisticated understanding or models of shadow material, that is, personal, repressed, dissociated, disowned, unconscious material. And then Ken Wilber goes into more detail about the need for religious traditions to have an awareness of psychological truth. Because we've all seen the situation, let me put this down, we've all seen the situation where the enlightened teacher has a sex scandal. We've seen the situation where the enlightened teacher makes a racist remark, or maybe that same teacher has a certain vice, or a certain outburst, or a certain revealing of the shadow, which indicates that the state is not the same as the structure. Within integral philosophy, there is a difference between a state of consciousness and a structure of consciousness. If you want a metaphor to bring it all together, we can typically imagine that evolution or individuation is like a ladder that we climb, and spirit is both the top rung on that ladder, the level that we reach towards, but it's also the ladder itself. Spirit is also the wood that we climb, and who is the self? Well, we are the self which is climbing the ladder, and we're also spirit, but we're also a self with many parts and many sub-personalities. So this is where it gets interesting if you want to continue the metaphor. The challenge with someone who is the enlightened Zen teacher, who hasn't done the shadow work, or hasn't done the trauma healing work, or maybe they're from a culture which doesn't encourage that for one reason or another, they could get to the state, which is the vibration, or the awareness, or the 
whatever you want to call it. There's lots of new age language that tries to capture this feeling, but the state of consciousness, the peak experience, the ultimate Satori glimpsing Nirvana enlightenment moment without having structurally reoriented the ego, without having looked at the climber themselves and realizing that you can get to the top rung on that ladder, but if you're still smoking, the whole way up that ladder, you're going to reach the enlightened state and still have a bad addiction problem. Something which Ken Wilber goes into on the next page. Um, he actually talks about Dr. Roger Walsh, who is a psychiatrist and a Buddhist teacher. And if you rec recognize the name, this is a book that you might have heard of. Hopefully you can see that. Essential Spirituality by Roger Walsh. It's a wonderful transpersonal view on how to practice that spiritual but not religious. But I digress. That's a tangent for you to explore if you're interested. The reason that Ken Wilber brings up Roger Walsh in this fat volume of almost 700 pages of integral spirituality is that Walsh is someone who's interesting because he's a psychotherapist and a Buddhist teacher. And he found that in his one-to-one -one situations, and I quote, people would come to see him after the main meditative circle. Um, and Ken Wilber's quoting him in saying, and he says that around 80% of the issues that come up are mostly psychotherapeutic, not spiritual or meditative. And so he responds with therapeutic techniques and suggestions, not meditative or spiritual ones. And a little further down, he explores this topic, but in a nutshell, he's basically saying that we need both, and that we're such, that we are made up in such a way in our modern era, in the 21st century, where psychotherapy and spirituality cannot live a separate existence. We can't do the old school church and state and never shall the two entwine. Inner work is a place that walks on that bridge between the realms. It walks in the bridge between many realms. It's often very difficult in this field of work to try and describe accurately what I do because it's the intersection of many overlapping spheres of human experience, not only religion and spirituality, meted with psychotherapy and healing, but also the many levels within therapy and the many levels within spirituality. There's all these crossover moments. What's clearly happening is that there's a thirst for healing and a thirst for God, which are overtaking people without their conscious understanding. It's something which we can't help but be drawn towards. There comes a moment on our healing journey where we find ourselves needing to meditate. We find ourselves needing to make a pilgrimage or what of one kind or another, either into the local forest or just to the local church or the ashram, or maybe even going on a journey. This is why some people go to India, why some people travel halfway across the world to basically find themselves. They need a change in environment to be able to witness their internal environment with a new perspective. But how do we get there? What's the point of this video? Am I just going to give you a variety of random uh, proclamations about what it means to blend the two worlds together? Well, no. Ken Wilber does thankfully have a really simple, really simple, very difficult to execute, but very simple to explain process of integrating our spirituality in a way which satisfies our various needs. And it's his wake up, grow up, clean up and show up idea. It's his idea that states and structures and levels and lines of development, as well as the different quadrants of our personalities, is all very integral theory talk. I highly recommend that you study it for yourself. But in essence, the many elements of what it means to be a human, to be a soul, to be part of a collective and to be an individual, to have a conscious and unconscious, to have an unconscious with higher, middle, lower unconscious, to have a conscious with higher, middle, lower conscious, and the many depths and rabbit holes that you can go into can all be captured in this idea of integral life practice, which is waking up, growing up, cleaning up, and showing up. So it seems worthwhile to cover this invitation as something which is really practical for you to take away in this episode of the series. We've only got two more episodes left, and the final two episodes are getting very esoteric, so let's make it practical. Waking up, that's all about states, and growing up, that's all about structures. Roughly speaking, the structural model of integral theory goes from archaic to magic to mythic to modern or rational 
to postmodern or post-rational to integral. This is basically the evolution of the rational brain, but also the evolution of human consciousness in a broad sense. Of course, we have something which is archaic. We have a caveman consciousness. We have a magical consciousness, which sees God everywhere and sees the thunder and lightning as the rage of God, literally. And then we get mythic, which is a bit less literal, but still very engaged. And then we get to the modern, which is, no, that's actually not something to engage with. We get to the postmodern and the integral and so on and so forth. It's a huge area of exploration. And I don't want to get too lost into the structures themselves. Many people who are watching this video are already familiar with things like spiral dynamics, or maybe David Hawkins's model of um, transcending the levels of consciousness, his emotional scale, the various colors. We're familiar with these ideas that there is some kind of ladder or spiral which we develop up. Ken Wilber's model indicates that a structure is not the same as a state. And the same example of the Zen teacher who can go off and do horrific things, or maybe someone like um, an Osho or a Rajneesh. I don't know everything about his personal um, brand of spirituality and what was going on, but there are certain scandals that happen in certain spiritual communities when the shadow work has not been done, when that hasn't been a growing up of consciousness in addition to the waking up, because this is the key point. Every enlightenment sensation, every glimpse through another where you imagine you get up on that ladder, you've been down here, and you see through at that next level. Every glimpse is interpreted via the witness. And if the witness is polluted, if the witness is carrying baggage, if the witness is carrying outdated xenophobic ideas or some kind of distorted idea of masculine feminine conflict, whatever that might be, they're going to perceive what they see with that lens. It's almost as if they have a permanent pair of glasses on which says mythic consciousness or postmodern consciousness or ideally integral consciousness. Of course, it might not make too much sense if this is your first time hearing these words because I'm just throwing out phrases, but it's a, it's a thing, it's established. An example that I could give you is, say, someone who's only ever grown up in a small community where the community over there is always the enemy and they should be killed on sight. This is maybe a dramatic example, but let's imagine, I guess this is what we're going with, you were born into a small tribal community for some reason, it's a particularly violent tribal community, and depending on which anthropology you want to study, that did exist. It's not all love and rainbows back in the Stone Age, but a much smaller group of societies were that active, destructive kind, again, another tangent, we're not going to go into the history, let's stay with the metaphor. You've been taught since birth that the, I don't know, let's say the green people over there, you're the purple people, and the green people over there, let's keep it, you know, casual, always to be killed on sight. They are the worst enemy, and whatever reason, all the shadow projections got onto them. You could be a nice, wonderful uh, purple person, and you could be sat in meditation, maybe accidentally even, and suddenly... God floods in and you get a vision of what it means to be the perfect, enlightened purple person. And because of your level of consciousness and your level of myth and narrative and cultural embeddedness, you actually see that as being a divine message from God to allow more space for the purple people like yourself to get bigger as a purple person by eradicating all the greens. And therefore you go on a jihad, you go on a crusade. This isn't too unlike actual history in the Middle Ages. What does it mean for Islam and Christianity to go to war against each other both in the name of God? It means shadow projection. Of course, we can't go back and it's a ridiculous idea to even imagine what would it mean to give inner work to the Templars of Jerusalem to see if that changes how they react to Salah ad -Din. I don't think that's necessarily a, it's a fun conversation, but it's not you know, the best way to go. The point hopefully stands. The structure of consciousness and the state of consciousness are two different things, and we need to work on both. We need to actively work on waking up progressively and incrementally, and growing up progressively and incrementally. Some theorists say that it takes normally an average of five years to go through the stages. Very rarely will you find someone who's at integral level before the age of 25, or some would say 30 usually actually in midlife that people get to this moment of synthesis and holding multiple perspectives. But what does this mean in terms of cleaning up and showing up? Well, this is more directly the therapeutic part 
of integral spirituality. It's something which this whole channel is dedicated towards. It's somatic healing, it's cathartic release, it's clearing out addictions like drink, drugs, and sexual distortions. It's doing the cleanup work, and a metaphor that I love that really resembles the cleanup work, at least in my personal experience, is that there's two stages, which is really one stage. I want you to imagine that the cleanup process is seeing yourself as a container, let's say a polished vessel, let's say you're a polished, beautiful, mirrored vase at your core, but through trauma and through difficulty and suffering and horror, soot has accumulated on that vase and one day you wake up and think that you are black to the core and you are a dirty, pathetic, ash-ridden vase, or not even a vase at that point, you call yourself a pot, you're just an ugly, ashen pot. The cleaning up process is taking a rag. I haven't got a rag anywhere. No, there's no rags. Imagine I have a rag. I'm taking a rag. And eventually, I realize that it comes off. That's the cleaning up stage. It's removing the gunk. And after a few years of doing this inner work, full spectrum, trauma release, and self-introspective practice, you realize that you're actually not covered in ash. And that takes us to the next stage, which is the initial shadow work has been done, the initial unburdening has been done, and then we get to polish and shine. This is the polishing to get to that true reflective period, not that you are only a reflective vessel that's empty. Of course, it's not a complete metaphor, but I hope it stands. Removing and then refining, that's the cleaning up process in a few sentences. The showing up process is being willing to enter into the public square, being willing to show up in the community, being willing to give back to the world and do that thing that you've been putting off for a while, and actually show up in your fullness, in your power, and give back. We can't do this all at once. We can't wake up, grow up, clean up, and show up on the exact same day. It's usually many years of going in and out pushing different levers up. Maybe we get to a stage where we have a peak enlightenment experience in meditation after six months of practicing every day. And roughly at the same time, we're kind of shifting towards integral consciousness in terms of our state. We've also done a few years of shadow work and we've started to build up some kind of offering in the world. It's never complete, but we're always trying to find that moment of completion and integration between the many threads of what it means to be a human. And this is integral spirituality, to my understanding, to the best of what I can summarize in under 20 minutes. The old traditions are not relevant for us. The new traditions are yet to emerge. We're in a world and a historic moment of spiritual but not religious therapy and religion are finding a way to come together. And if I've learned one thing from my one-to-one -one in work mentorships, which I run with people for four months at a time, so you can't avoid the question of God. We may like to believe that we can in a wonderfully modern digital age. If you're like me, you didn't grow up with too much of a religious presence. I grew up in a atheistic background, or at least maybe in a casual sing hymns at school, but not really be Christian kind of background. From that place of atheism, or at least agnosticism, or light Christianity, or just general dissociation from God as something which could give back to us. It doesn't mean that it's not something that we don't start to explore when we're given the time and the space and the honest introspective awareness to ask the big questions and try and develop a living relationship with the God outside and the God within. Language fails me there. Hopefully that's not triggering for some people, but the sense of spirit. Spirit being the top rung on the ladder and being every grain of wood that the ladder is made out of. Being yourself as the climber, recognizing that the ladder is not directly upwards, but the healing spiral between the polarities of light and dark, positive and negative, charged and undercharged. This is integral spirituality starting to take place. I don't know what it's going to look like in the next decade, the next two decades, but hopefully... If we can figure it out, we will find a way to bring back sanctity and sacredness to a dissociative and often shallow world. If you like these ideas, I invite you to join me on the next episode of Inner Work Essentials, 
the last two episodes are now here. We're going to be looking at glamour, a world problem. And if that triggers for you images of blonde breast enhancements and full makeup, that's not the original meaning of glamour. It's actually something which relates to our spiritual distortions and the way that we continually delude ourselves from our true power. It's very much a question of integral spirituality. It's being bedazzled by that which we don't understand. If you want to learn more about it, right over there, the next episode of Inner Work Essentials. I'd love to see you there.